After digging in the sand in Israel on a volunteer archaeological project and trying to discover new history, it was imperative that Egypt was next. The two countries are so tightly bound throughout biblical history, but the Bible glosses over many of the particulars. For instance, referring to the Pharaoh as just that, Pharaoh, without any designation or name. I needed to see what else was left out. And where better to start the journey than the Grand Cairo Museum, also known as the Museum of Egyptian Antiquities. Built in 1901 and boasting over 120,000 historical artifacts, it's at the end of its lifespan. For 2021, a brand new Grand Egyptian Museum at Giza will be launched. Though the wooden glass display cases with brass typewriter print labels were reminiscent of a particular movie series that's the backbone of my life. The stolen antiquities market is booming around the world. A stolen statue of Tutankhamun was sold at Christie's Auction House in London for almost 5 million pounds. It's a perpetual effort by the Egyptian government and other international agencies to recover and repatriate these. It's a full day experience and a guide is essential. Otherwise, you'll be roaming the halls overwhelmed with information that will seem unretainable. Mind you, it seems like almost everyone walking the street, including your private driver, will call themselves an authentic Egyptologist. Make sure to tell your guides up front that you already know the Osiris myth. Otherwise, you'll be bound to hear it over and over again. Okay, so let me summarize this whole story in about a minute. The story goes that the Egyptian god Osiris is murdered by his brother Set for his throne. Set had a huge party, invited his brother over, and showed him a giant wooden chest. The first person to fit in the chest perfectly would be allowed to keep it. Unbeknownst to Osiris, his brother had measured him while he was asleep and hired a carpenter to make a flawless fit after he would cross his arms. His brother slammed it shut and dumped it in the Nile. Osiris' wife, Isis, bolted to the river and found the chest after days of searching. She hid the body in the grass and planned to perform resurrection rituals. However, Set found the body and cut it up into 14 chunks and scattered them throughout the entire country. Isis transformed into a huge bird and managed to collect and reassemble 13 of these minus his penis, which was allegedly eaten by fish in the Nile. With the help of the gods, a full moon, and some classic mummification techniques, he was brought back to life. Unfortunately, he already had a new title waiting for him as the King of the Afterlife, but promised her that her new son, Horus, would soon be delivered to her and that he would defeat Set. Old Cairo is a great place to stroll the streets and see some of the origins of Egypt's Coptic Christian heritage. Notably, the Hanging Church, the Coptic Museum, and the Fortress of Babylon. Islam, which is now the predominant religion, up to 95%, now dominates the country with mosques seemingly every few blocks. I'm not sure what was going through my head. I was having a wicked case of FOMO and I dragged my friend through what must have been eight or more mosques. They almost all look the same when you're inside. Pick one and fly with it. Women are often either not permitted to enter mosques or are required to pray in separate areas. When they are permitted inside, a head covering for women, sometimes even full robes, are required. For men, just show up in your t-shirt and jeans. When I was atop the Cairo Tower for a sunset dinner over the Nile, I accidentally ordered alcohol without thinking. I learned pretty quickly to be mindful of traveling during Ramadan, the holy month. It's not permitted to eat, drink, smoke, or have sex from dawn to dusk. While some locals tolerate foreigners who don't respect this tradition, it's very likely you'll meet some pushback at less touristy destinations. I heard rumors about how bad garbage was in the country, and it is very noticeable in some areas, like Old Cairo. Apparently only 6% of the waste produced gets processed, and even less gets recycled. The rest gets chucked in city streets, waterways, and illegal dump sites. The traffic? It's just as crazy as other developing countries. So when crossing roads, maintain a steady but quick pace, and make eye contact with the drivers. They will go around you. The Ramses II statue is a prime example of the ample Ramses statues you'll find all around Egypt. The guy had an ego worthy of Instagram. He erected more statues than any other pharaoh. He would even go as far as to changing existing inscriptions on pharaoh's statues to glorify himself. So I was debating if I wanted to share this memory or not, but I was going to the elaborate Kanakalili street market and pounded back a random beverage. I've eaten street meat in Peru, food off the floor in my kitchen, dined in family restaurants all over India, but have never been instantly sick like that. To this day, I still have no clue how I was poisoned, but that didn't stop me from going back. I was on a mission. I wasn't in search of your typical trinkets. I was in search of something more, something that was more than meets the eye. Embarrassed by what I was asking for, I browsed a few local shops, and nothing quite matched what I had wanted. I caved and discreetly explained to the shopkeep that I wanted an old, oil-looking lamp made of brass. He came back three or four times before I nodded. 
He grimaced. His laugh bellowed. Ah, so you want Aladdin's lamp, he said. I went beat red. But he wasn't wrong. The pyramids on the Giza Plateau were one of the seven wonders that I was itching to have off my list. The Step Pyramid of Djoser is the oldest of all of them, dating back to the 27th century BC. The nearby structures are adorned with cobras, which signify royalty, and were also found as head ornaments on masks. At the same complex, the Pyramid of Unos was unique, because you could actually go inside. The stain of ochre was still prominent on the hieroglyphs decorating the walls. Unlike English, hieroglyphs can be read left to right or right to left. It depends which way the characters in the script are facing. Cartouches are ovals surrounding a set of hieroglyphs, indicating a royal name. Originally, the pyramids had capstones covered in gold or electrum, a mixture of gold and silver. But many haven't survived to this day except for the one at the Pyramid of Khafra, which also happens to be the iconic spot to hop a camel and get your photo with the pyramids in the background, and also that kissy photo with the Sphinx. The Sphinx, also which I should mention, is exponentially smaller than I had imagined. Only about three two-story houses tall. Contrary to popular belief, it wasn't a cannonball that took off its nose during Napoleon's reign, and it was actually removed mysteriously between the 3rd and 10th centuries. For less than a hundred bucks, we were able to take a full day tour to Alexandria, the legendary old capital city that once featured the famous lighthouse, one of the original ancient wonders. After a series of catastrophic earthquakes hundreds of years ago, it became nothing more than ruins. That wasn't until the citadel of Cape Bay was built over top. They used many of the original building stones to save time and money. In 2002, a new library of Alexandria was built. While it can't remotely compete with the immensity of the British Library or the Library of Congress, it still is a gorgeous architectural site. If you've never done one before, check out the ancient Roman amphitheater. It's one of the only of its type in Egypt, and it was actually only recently discovered in 1960 when work was underway to construct a new local government building. Erecting giant pillars was a sign of societal greatness and military conquest. Standing at almost 27 meters, Pompey's pillar is the tallest monolithic column. The catacombs of Komal Shukafa are unique because they were a burial chamber to intern multiple cultures over time. The ancient Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans. It gets its name, which literally translates to Mound of Shards, for the immense amount of broken pottery found at the site. Ancient Egyptians used to bring food and drink offerings to the deceased so that their souls could absorb the nutrients from the afterlife. Due to our limited time, we skipped the camping portion and made it a single day trip out to the black and white deserts. Apparently, the temperature drop at night on the sand is intense. Made of chalk, the white desert is notable for its mushroom-shaped rocks which were eroded by wind and sand over thousands of years after the ocean retreated. At its heart, stop by the Valley of Agabat for some additional gorgeous formations. The Black Desert contains volcanic-shaped cones littered around seemingly at random. The black color comes from dolerite and black basalt. Crystal Mountain isn't really a mountain per se, but a series of small dunes littered with calcite crystal. A great place to amplify your hippie energy. If we had enough time, the Siwa Oasis would have been a dream to see as well. We settled instead for the Bahariya Oasis. I'm pretty sure I wanted to see the nearby Salt Lake, perhaps. I'm not too sure. I was so keen on hot water though that my guide tried to appease us and took us to a tiny rectangular pool with water that was boiling. Oops. In the 1960s, the Aswan Dam was created to bolster hydroelectric power and control the flooding of the Nile to maximize agriculture. Unfortunately, the ancient temple of Abu Simbel was in the way. Besides the pyramids, it was one of the most recognizable locations in all of Egypt. Built in 1244 BC, they were carved into the mountainside but later relocated to make way for the dam. It was a multinational effort. The temple was carved up block by block, tagged, and reassembled 180 meters west of their original site. The temple itself has four statues of Ramses II at the entryway, about 70 feet tall each. On two days of the year, February 22nd and October 22nd, the inner chamber is illuminated by the sun. Historians believe these represent the days of his birth and coronation. Nefertari, his wife, also has a temple on site. The Philae Temple, on an island just south of the city centre, honoured the cult of Isis for over a thousand years. We heard a story about how a celebrity essentially rented out the entire island for a day for tens of thousands of dollars. Due to the massive decline in tourism, we had almost the same experience for free. The Temple of Kamambo was next on my list. City taxis aren't often allowed to take tourists outside of certain permitted safe zones. We worked a deal out with a local and were taken to a sketchy back alley where we prayed everything would go as planned. The temple is unique because it's one of the only temples that is dedicated to four gods. Sobek, the crocodile god of fertility and creator of the world, 
Hathor, the god with roles everything from music and dance to the sky and motherhood, Kensu, the god of the moon and time, and Horus the Elder, one of the numerous forms of the Horus deity. The monastery at St. Simeon is a 10th century complex that housed the monks that attempted to convert the nearby Nubians to Christianity. Nubians are from South Egypt and Northern Sudan. Today, they're known for their brightly colored buildings, but ancient Nubia was a portal for luxury items like ebony, incense, and ivory. They're also infamously known for their accuracy in archery. The unfinished obelisk was to be one of the greatest ever created at 42 meters, but after years of carving it out of the nearby bedrock, massive cracks began to appear throughout it, and the project was abandoned. Because it's unfinished, it gives some clues to the stoneworking techniques of the ancients. The spirit of my inner adventurer came out when I came to the incredibly well-preserved Temple of Horus at Edfu. I bolted through the temple gates. It contains detailed accounts of the battle between Horus and Set from the Osiris myth, and his eventual victory. Though honestly, at this point, I was in massive temple burnout. Everything was starting to look the same, but I knew the best was just ahead. The Valley of the Kings in Luxor was the greatest archaeological find of all time. The kings and queens of the New Kingdom weren't entombed in pyramids. Many theories exist for this, including engineering and degradation issues to grave robbery. These tombs had some of the most complete, untouched artifacts ever found. Mind you, while you'd find things like golden masks, other less thrilling items like furniture, pets, and even underwear were buried. This is also the resting place for the boy king, Tutankhamun. Nearby, the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut is astronomically aligned with the winter solstice sunrise, and she had it built in such a grand scale to ensure her image and status would outlast her mortal life. Drop into an ancient workers' village nearby as well. Built by Ramses III, Karnak is an impressive complex and one of the most visited in Egypt. It was a place of worship where the god Amun would interact with everyday people. It is also the largest religious building in the world at 200 acres, but the folks in Cambodia would say it's Angkor Wat at 162 acres. In Luxor itself, there's the Luxor Museum, which is a skip and it's no comparison for the one in Cairo. The Luxor Temple is particularly unique because it's not for godly worship, but is dedicated to the rejuvenation of kingship, a spot where kings and queens were crowned. If your brain isn't temple fried yet, check out the Temple of the Goddess Hathor, an hour and a half north. It has very well preserved relief work. The most impressive of them all being the zodiac on the ceiling of one of the chambers. I'm glad I didn't miss that. It was adrenaline time. Arriving in Ergata near the end of our trip, I quickly googled some final attractions. It was time to spice things up a bit and forget about temples. After a crash course on how to drive an ATV on the dunes, we raced through the desert sand to a settlement where we had a chance to eat some local food, get spat on by camels, smoke hookah, and drive off into the setting sun before lighting a fire circle around ourselves in gasoline. Epic. Day two of adventuring, I felt like I was going to die. My friend booked us into a scuba experience in the Red Sea. She had done a fine job of humoring me the rest of the itinerary, and scuba had been on my list for ages. The guide spoke virtually zero English, and I think I was expected to know what I was doing because she had Patty herself. One linked arms with me and dove down, down. My head felt like it was going to explode. Thankfully, I realized I had to plug my nose and blow to re-equalize my air pressure. But one dive was more than enough without training. On our very last day, we headed to Desert Breath, which is a seemingly random spiral land art exhibit in the desert. You can even see it on Google Earth. It was built in 1997, so it was looking a little rough these days. The cute way I wrapped up the trip was by going to Sand City in Mini Egypt. It was a fun way to recap all the major attractions I had seen. It really felt like I had done it all after walking through those two parks. And I could now finally say it. Mission accomplished.